Hello, Thicket Forum. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with you all on the topic of thicket restoration. The title of my talk is Restoring Speckworm Thicket at a Scale that is Meaningful for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. By speckworm thicket, I'm referring to the speckworm dominated arid thicket that Jan Flock spoke about in an earlier Thicket Forum talk. With speckworm being the remarkable plant Portulacaria afra, also sometimes called pork bush or Ulifant's kos. In the slides ahead, I'll show how 1.2 million hectares of speckworm thicket has been degraded and how some of this degraded land has been restored over the past 50 years. Following that, I'll discuss a potential road forward for restoring the 1.2 million hectares. Throughout the talk, I purposefully focus on the road's smooth surface and not the potholes or barriers that we'll also undoubtedly encounter along the way. I've divided the smooth surface into three broad S's, namely speckworms properties, science and socioeconomics. Lastly, I suggest some immediate actions that landowners and scientists can take for attracting the investment required for restoration at this scale. 10 years ago, advocating the vision of restoring 1.2 million hectares would have been difficult. It would have been seen as outlandishly optimistic. The UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which was launched on the 4th of June this year, has changed the global narrative by highlighting that implementing restoration at this sort of scale may be ambitious, but it's also essential for achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. Restoration of speckworm thicket has the potential for pioneering a route forward for this UN decade, showing the rest of the world that restoration at the scale of a million hectares is feasible. But let's start with having a look at the degradation we are needing to tackle. The stark contrast between intact thicket and degraded thicket can be seen along numerous fence lines in the Eastern and Western Cape. This particular video is in the Sundays River Valley, south of Kirkwood. The light green tinge from the annual grasses and opslach that have come up on the right of the fence after some rainfall mask the extreme desertification. The degraded speckworm thicket is usually a brown landscape. These photos provide a better sense of the extreme desertification, erosion, and loss of biodiversity associated with the degradation. The exposed roots of the papier tree on the right show the amount of topsoil that has been lost from these landscapes. This is what the landscape should look like. The cause of the degradation is primarily overstocking with Angora goats. The extent of the degradation is startling and alarming. Aerial photographs from the 1940s show that this entire landscape south and southwest of Kirkwood should be a dark green, not the brown that it is. Here's a zoomed in picture of part of that landscape showing fence line contrasts on three sides of one degraded farm. We've calculated that more than 1.2 million hectares of speckworm thicket have been degraded like this. This fence line contrast shows how the degradation results in a clearing out of some plants and not others. The trees remaining on the left side of the fence are Papia capensis, known as the jacket plum or doprem. On the right side of the fence, you'll see a light green matrix of speckworm around the papier trees. It is this matrix of speckworm, together with tens of other plant species, that are lost with extreme degradation. Fortunately, this matrix of speckworm can be restored by planting cuttings of the plant. The best example of such restoration that I'm aware of happened on this farm, Crompwort south of Kirkwood in the early 1970s. Mr. Graham Slater, who owned the farm at the time, was battling with the salty water that was running off the slope into his newly built barn after intense rainfall events. He opted to plant speckworm cuttings as a soil erosion measure. The result was remarkable in that it stopped the erosion of the slope and the flooding of the barn 
and restored much of the plant diversity of the thicket vegetation. Here was proof of concept that speckworm cuttings like this can potentially result in restoration of speckworm thicket. Here's another view of that proof of concept showing photos from 2003 and 2021. Notice how the speckworm in the center has grown to form a matrix around the papier trees. The rate of carbon capture that occurred at this site was impressive for an arid area. Approximately 15 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year was captured over a 27 year period. The restoration achieved by Graham Slater was inspiring and led to the government funded subtropical thicket restoration program in 2004. This program had the vision of catalyzing large scale restoration of speckworm thicket. One of the actions of the program was to set up what is arguably the largest restoration experiment on the planet. The aim of the experiment was to find out where Graham Slater's restoration could be replicated across the thicket biome and which methods of planting speckworm cuttings are most effective. The blue dots in this map show the locations of more than 300 quarter hectare plots that were set up in 2008 in this experiment. In each plot, several thousand speckworm cuttings were planted out in rows with 14 different methods of planting used. As we undertake another drone flight, you'll see two restoration plots, one in the foreground and one in the background. We'll zoom into the one in the background, which is one of the many restoration plots from 2008 and 2009 that mirrored what Graham Slater was able to achieve on his farm, Crompwood. The plot in the foreground that we've just flown over was a plot planted out 18 months ago by the landowner. He and his wife were so enthused with how well the speckworm had grown in the experimental plot that they took secateurs and picks into the field themselves to increase the size of the restored area on their land. Their vision was to ultimately restore their whole farm, which has about 250 hectares needing intensive restoration. This year, funding was raised to achieve this vision. 100 hectares have been planted out with speckworm cuttings in the first few months of the year, and most of these cuttings have already rooted. Here's another one of the experimental plots with the Coxcomb Mountain in the background. What's particularly heartening about plots like these is that all 14 speckworm treatments did remarkably well, even the pencil thin cuttings, which we called fingerlings. It's also heartening that in these restoration plots, other plants in addition to speckworm are recovering. Notice how the papier tree on the right of the photo, for example, has flourished over the period 2009 to 2021. Animals are also benefiting. In my experience, when walking through experimental plots like this, one encounters far more birds compared with the adjacent degraded land. And we've been delighted to find specimens like this beautiful Eastern Cape dwarf chameleon, Bradypodium ventral. It is unlikely we would have encountered this charismatic animal if speckworm had not been planted here back in 2009 by the subtropical thicket restoration program. So how can we ramp up Graham Slater's work to restore 1.2 million hectares and bring back the biodiversity, the topsoils, the herbivore carrying capacity, the carbon, the animals, and the beautiful aesthetics of intact thicket. Elephants and speckworm are, I suggest, a good place to start when pondering this challenge. Elephants are messy eaters when it comes to speckworm. They usually leave behind pieces like this. Here's another piece with a spa bag for scale. And these are the roots on that same piece. Despite being left on the soil surface, the roots managed to find their way into the soil. A recent honors study by Lara Wattam at Nelson Mandela University, supervised by Alistair Potts and Graham Curley, found that of 200 pieces of speckworm discarded by elephants in Quandwe Game Reserve, 
approximately 20% rooted. It's advantageous for the elephant to have more speckworm in their landscape. So perhaps the messy eating is not an accident. Perhaps a mutualism of sorts has evolved over millions of years. Lara Wattam's findings suggest that by harvesting and planting speckworm cuttings, we are harnessing this mutualism and the inherent adaptive capacities of this plant. We're not swimming upstream here. By contrast, we're floating on our backs downstream at a pleasant rate, working with nature, not against it. The resilience of speckworm cuttings to the harsh conditions of degraded speckworm thicket is astounding. Despite soil surface temperatures over 70 degrees Celsius in summer and minimal rain, cuttings can produce dense roots like these after a few months of being planted into dry soil. Science and technology are undoubtedly also a critical part of restoring 1.2 million hectares of speckworm thicket. It's the credible data on a wide range of topics that will convince funders and landowners of the value of undertaking such restoration. Fortunately, the Subtropical Thicket Restoration Program has already created a strong scientific platform, which is resulting in restoration being funded at the scale of thousands of hectares. Many tens of papers have been published since 2004 on speckworm thicket restoration, such as this paper by Van Lake et al. in 2013, showing how soil water content is considerably greater under intact thicket than degraded thicket. Other research has shown that the plant diversity of Graham Slater's restoration site has recovered so well over a few decades that it now closely resembles the nearby intact thicket. Moving forward, I'm hopeful that science and technology will play a major role in fast tracking the upscaling of restoration in degraded speckworm thicket to tens of thousands of hectares a year. Funders and landowners will want to know how well their speckworm plants are growing over such vast areas. This is not a straightforward task if one's using a clipboard and tape measure. Drones and machine learning are, however, showing great promise in terms of being able to provide frequent data on the vigor and size of their speckworm at such scales. This is a drone image of one of the experimental plots. Robert Duker and Alistair Potts from the Speckworm Restoration Research Group at Nelson Mandela University, in collaboration with researchers in Germany, are analyzing such images using machine learning. The results are extremely promising, as this slide shows. The algorithms are separating out individual speckworm plants from other vegetation in this experimental plot. The biomass of the plants can theoretically be calculated from these images, but that is work in progress. It's also likely that further training will enable the algorithms to determine the health of the plant by picking up subtle differences in the color of the leaves. Lastly, the socioeconomic factors in degraded speckworm thicket are lining up in such a way that restoration over 1.2 million hectares is looking feasible. Landowners are indicating their willingness to enter into long-term agreements to restore the speckworm thicket on their properties and although these Angora goats were the force of degradation, it's likely that they can be part of the solution if managed well. The research that has been done on livestock farming and speckworm thickets suggests that intensive use of the thicket for a few weeks of the year, followed by a rest for a year to 18 months, can maintain the thicket and even improve its vigor. This has yet to be demonstrated on restored speckworm thicket and needs urgent attention from rangeland scientists. Professor Armi Okamp, who spent much of his career studying goats and thicket, advised us that the restored speckworm thicket above Graham Slater's barn, outlined in blue in this photograph, could sustain 10 times more goats per unit area than the adjacent degraded land outlined in red. The ramifications of this observation are profound. Goat farmers could potentially earn 10 times more from restored speckworm thicket than from their degraded land. The financial benefits for the landowner wouldn't stop there. Last week, I met with a land evaluator near Kirkwood who advised that land with restored speckworm thicket on it would sell for a price 50% higher than degraded land. Increases in herbivore carrying capacity and increases in land value are consequently likely to be part of the economic recipe for rolling out restoration 
over 1.2 million hectares of degraded speckworm thicket. As the UN decade on ecosystem restoration develops momentum, I can envisage a future where speckworm friendly mohair is selling for a price several times greater than speckworm degrading mohair. So what actions are needed by landowners and the scientific community to have speckworm thicket restoration pioneering a road forward to restore ecosystems at the scale that the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration is calling for? A first step, I suggest, is to try and fully absorb the magnitude of the task. It's difficult to envisage what one million hectares of thicket restoration would actually entail. One way to put it in perspective is to imagine driving along a road at 100 kilometers per hour through the degraded landscape needing restoration, where the horizon on either side of the road is five kilometers away. To see one million hectares of degraded landscape, you would need to drive for 10 hours. To see one billion hectares, the area of land that is needing restoration globally, you would need to drive for 417 days. The enormity of the task is certainly daunting, but back of the envelope calculations show that if we employ 4,000 people over the next 10 years to do what this team is currently doing in the Sundays River Valley, then we will reach our goal of 1.2 million hectares before the end of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration in 2030. 4,000 people may sound like a lot, but it's a manageable number when considering operations in other sectors like mining and construction. It's undoubtedly achievable if the funds were to be made available. This drone video footage by Robert Duker shows the magnificent scenery of the Sundays River Valley and gives a sense of the scale of the operations we need to undertake. It's going to be a tremendously rewarding and stimulating journey as we watch freshly planted landscapes like these transform into intact speckworm thicket. The big question, of course, is where will the funds for such restoration come from? I'm confident that the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration will be able to facilitate such funding by matching funders with willing landowners. Such funders will need reassurance on two main points. Firstly, they'll want to know that the speckworm will thrive in the landscape into which it will be planted. For this reason, my advice to landowners wanting to restore their land is to start planting speckworm immediately, even if it's only in very small plots to be able to demonstrate that the particular environmental conditions on their land, particularly in relation to herbivory pressure, are conducive to speckworm plants growing well. Secondly, funders will want to know that the speckworm will be managed well over decades and will continue to thrive even if the land ownership changes. Biodiversity stewardship agreements or conservation easements will be required to provide this assurance to funders. Landowners who have these agreements in place will in all likelihood be at the front of the queue for receiving funding that arises through the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So this is another action I'd advise landowners to do if they are wanting to restore their properties. In conclusion, the restoration that Graham Slater undertook above his barn in the Eastern Cape is a beacon of light for the Eastern Cape and for the world at large. It shows how one individual's actions can catalyze major investments in restoration. He set off a chain reaction of government, scientists, landowners and investors motivating each other and working together towards a common vision of large scale restoration. We can all potentially play a role in continuing this chain reaction to reach the goal of restoring the 1.2 million hectares of degraded speckworm thicket over the next decade. Speckworm needs to be planted, science needs to be conducted, and funds need to be raised. Please also consider how you can support the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration by setting off chain reactions in other ecosystems. As global citizens, we need such chain reactions restoring a billion hectares as a matter of urgency 
Importantly, we can't wait for the researchers to develop the optimal restoration protocols. Large-scale restoration and rigorous long-term research now need to be conducted in parallel at unprecedented scales. It's a pioneering, exciting time in the field of restoration ecology. Thank you for listening. Lastly, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many organizations, landowners, and colleagues who are making major contributions to the vision of restoring 1.2 million hectares of degraded speckworm thicket. Over and out from me in Takai, Cape Town, I look forward to further discussions on the Thicket Forum's WhatsApp chat. Thank you.